welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. There are so many different levels to the Republicans' assault on democracy right now that sometimes I know it's hard to keep track, but here goes. It all started with a year-long misinformation campaign led by Donald Trump to sow doubt in the election process. Then Trump lost and claimed that he had won. And that big lie turned out to be so powerful among Republicans that some states are still searching for fraud that absolutely does not exist. Today in Arizona, Republicans resumed their so-called audit of about 2 million ballots in Maricopa County. They had to stop for a while because they got kicked out of there for high school graduations. But now they're back and still led by a company called, wait for it, Cyber Ninjas. And this is camera two live streaming, streaming the audit. Here's camera eight. Do any of these people look like they're in a hurry to you? Really? Any of them? Anybody look like a cyber ninja to you? Despite the fact that this whole thing in Arizona has turned into a complete laughing stock, Republicans in Georgia are actually following their lead. On Friday, a judge ruled that absentee ballots in Fulton County can be unsealed and reviewed after allegations of fraud. And while Republicans try to relitigate the last election, they're also working to gain any advantage they can in upcoming elections. If you're a regular viewer of our show, then you've seen this map from the Brennan Center plenty of times. It shows the 47 states that are pushing more than 360 voter suppression bills across the country. So we had the big lie. We have the search for non-existent fraud based on that big lie. We have new voting restrictions based on the big lie. And now we have backers of the big lie running for positions that would oversee future elections, which sounds really bad. Politico is reporting today on the Trump allies running to be top election officials in key battleground states. And the headline says it all. They tried to overturn the 2020 election. Now they want to run the next one. In Arizona, one of the biggest backers of the crazy audit is actually running to be secretary of state. In Michigan, a Republican who spent weeks challenging the election results in both court and in conservative media is running for Secretary of State. And in Georgia, Congressman Jody Heiss voted against certifying the 2020 election results, and now he's running for Secretary of State. In case you forgot, he's also the guy who said this about the insurrection. The narrative that President Trump incited riots on January 6th I don't even understand, uh, Madam Chair, why you yourself don't speak the truth as to what President Trump actually stated and what he said on the morning of January 6th. He said that I know that every one of you will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard today. It was Trump supporters who lost their lives that day, uh, not Trump supporters who were taking the lives of others. Congressman Heiss does have some rep competition in his race. Georgia's current Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, is also running for re-election. After months of defending Georgia's elections as secure, he's now backing that new audit in Fulton County. In a statement, he said the county has a long-standing history of election mismanagement that has understandably weakened voters' faith in its system. But Brad, what? You're, you're in charge of it. Maybe Brad Raffensperger isn't the great defender of democracy he was made out to be. Well, we can't say his Democratic challenger, B. Wen, didn't warn us. Here she is on this show back in March. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is still a Trump ally. While we did appreciate the work that he did to ensure that his messaging was based on fact and truth, the reality is he was talking um, out of both sides of his mouth. On one hand, he said there's no voter fraud. On the other hand, he came in guns blazing into our committee meeting saying that he did support eliminating no excuse absentee ballot voting. 
Joining me now is Georgia State Representative B. Wen. She's also a candidate, like I said, for Georgia Secretary of State. Thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me on. So two of your challengers for Secretary of State are Jody Heiss, who, over, who voted to overturn the election, and Brad Raffensperger, who was backing this audit of Fulton County, even though he was the guy who was running the election. So what is your reaction to that? Georgians have a better choice than Brad Raffensperger and Jody Heist. Quite frankly, we have one person on the hand who is supporting the big lie, and then we have the current Secretary of State who understands that the voter suppression bill that we just passed through the General Assembly was predicated on that very same lie, and yet he is backing that bill. He has backed a bill that strips him of his own power, the power that Georgia voters voted him in to uphold. And here he is supporting an unnecessary audit. We've gone through three recounts, including one hand count. And this is just another waste of our taxpayer dollars. And it is another, eff another effort to undermine our democracy. And quite frankly, supporting this audit in Fulton County is dangerous. It seems like... You know, I don't really know the name of the Secretary of State. You know, that's not, you know, a, a position in the state government that, you know, people know offhand. And it seems to me like that's a good thing. We probably should not know the name of the Secretary of State, the person running the elections, because you want that election run seamlessly. And if that's done, then we don't know their name. But I do know the name of, um, you know, Catherine Clark from Florida and uh, Ken Blackwell from Ohio from the 2004 election. Uh, the, the first one I listed was 2000 election. So what does it look like if you're actually doing the job well? Will we not know your name? You know, I think we're in a unique position here in 2021. We saw everything that unfolded last year, and it will be critical to elect Secretary of State in every single state who will uphold the law, but also support voter expansion instead of voter suppression. I don't see any of the things that happened last year going away anytime soon. It seems that part of the Republican Party is doubling down on this message of the big lie without having any kind of evidence to move it forward. And instead of just accepting the results of the 2020 election, here we see this concerted effort to pass voter suppression laws throughout the United States in multiple states. And we've recently found out that it is being supported by millions of dollars of dark money through the Heritage Foundation. And we have it on record that their intent and their goal is to make it harder to vote. And so I see that every single Secretary of State in the next elections in 2022 is going to be a critical office that voters will be paying attention to because it is far too important to allow people who are continuing to erode our right to vote. It's interesting to think about which voters are paying attention to your point, um, because according to a new poll, over half of Republicans believe the election was rigged and that Donald Trump is actually the president, which I, that feels like a scary reality to live in. Um, but it's, it shows that his big lie worked. What is the counter message um, to voters so that the rest of the voters that don't fall in that conservative bucket um, realize what's happening here? That right now, uh, Republicans on the state level are trying to basically prefix <laughs> the upcoming elections uh, to take away that power and voice from mainly communities of color. I mean, the statistic that you just stated, Zerlita, is extremely alarming, and it does make sense in a lot of ways because it was a concerted effort led by the former president, but also Republicans across the country got behind that messaging. And as a result, we see this damage to our democracy that is not going away anytime soon. I think voters on the other side of the aisle, especially voters of color who understand that at the inception of this country, the only people who were allowed to vote were white men who held property and probably have stories within their families of who fought for the right to vote and how we were able to gain that right to vote. We know that that is fundamental and we have to protect it. We also know that the act of voting is what we use to participate in our democracy to see policy changes that aren't happening right now. And certainly in Georgia, that is true. We emerged from a legislative session in which Republicans refused to expand Medicaid, leaving half a million Georgians without insurance once again. 
we emerged from a legislative session in which we did not fix our issues with the Department of Labor. Or I have constituents who are still waiting for their unemployment checks, who have lost their homes, who have lost their cars. We could have done so much work to make the lives of Georgians better this past legislative session. Instead, we focused on a voting bill that was based on lies that will make it harder for all of us to vote. And I think Georgians are going to remember that when we go to the poll again. You mentioned the Heritage Foundation, and there was video that leaked um, of them talking about their plans to introduce voter suppression um, on, in a coordinated fashion. I mean, speak to this idea that this is not random. They didn't respond to the 2020 election results and go, hey, let's go brainstorm some policy ideas. They said, let's restrict the ballot uh, from those communities that just beat us. Yeah, it's a nefarious effort, and it is driven by those who uh, want to maintain power at all costs. And unfortunately, what we have seen is elected officials going along with this across the country because their number one goal is not to pass good policies or win with good ideas. Their goal is to stay in power no matter what. They understand that the former president has wreaked havoc on their party, and instead of taking this time to turn inwards, and reflect on how to rebuild a party, they are going along with all of these things that are happening because they quite frankly, rather maintain power at all costs and rather align themselves with the former president instead of trying to figure out what it is that they have to offer Americans. And because of that, our democracy is gonna continue to be at risk and they're gonna continue to allow people like the Heritage Foundation and all of that dark money to influence what's happening in our state and in our country. It should be the power of the people, not the power of the dark money groups. <laughs> uh, B. Wen, thank you so much for being here tonight again and joining us. Please stay safe. Quote, the so-called audit in Arizona is nothing more than a political stunt. I could have told you that the minute they started looking for bamboo fibers, that was the signal, everyone. <laughs> but that message carries a bit more weight coming from the Arizona Secretary of State, who wrote today, it's been over six months since, the, since Arizona held its 2020 general election, but there are some politicians who still refuse to accept the results simply because they don't approve of the outcome. The election results were certified months ago, and the Senate's audit will do nothing to change it. And joining me now is the Arizona Secretary of State back with us, Katie Hobbs. Secretary Hobbs, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. It's always great to be here. So where do things stand now with the so-called audit by the cyber ninjas? Um, do they have any hopes of finishing? They don't look like they're going very fast. No, it certainly doesn't look like it's going very fast. And there's every indication that they're now trying to drag this out for as long as possible because it has become a money-making scheme for uh, Trump and his allies and the Republican Party and the cyber ninjas. So I've heard talk of them expanding it to other counties in Arizona, to other races on the ballot. Who knows how long we're going to be here but um, in, the, in the time that they were already counting, they made it a quarter of the way through the ballots. Uh, as far as I know, they only have this building for another month before they have to get out again. What's insane about this is like, this is just one county. And so somehow they think they are going to exploit this fake audit um, to overturn the Electoral College. Like, it doesn't even make any sense. But I actually have a more serious question, which is a point that you raised recently, which is the security of the voting equipment that is there uh, in that uh, room that they are using. So just unpack that for us and why you flagged uh, last week that, you know, that equipment shouldn't ever be used again in elections. Well, we certainly take a lot of, of measures to ensure the integrity and the, the, the functioning of election equipment in our state. We certify it after it's been certified by the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. There are statutes and procedures in place that govern the security of the equipment. It's uh, not having it connected to the internet, transferring data on brand new thumb drives every time. These are all things that are in place. Um, and, and the chain of custody being maintained by 
certified election officials is a critical piece of, of the security measures. And that chain of custody was broken. And we alerted Maricopa County of this concern way back in February. Uh, and and um, now that concern has become a reality. Not only was the chain of custody broken, but we have no way of knowing what happened to the equipment while it was in the hands of the cyber ninjas. Um, there are not cameras in that room. We don't know what they did to it. They didn't allow our equipment expert to have any um, access to it at all. And there's no nothing in place that will provide assurance that the equipment has been tampered with beyond, uh, you know, that, that it's safe to use in future elections. How dangerous is it that the people that push the stop the steal lie um, are running for secretary of state to take positions like the one you have? It is incredibly, incredibly alarming to me. As the chief election officer of the state, I understand that I have a partisan history. I was the Senate minority leader. I'm not hiding from the fact that I'm a Democrat, but I have worked to execute my duties in a nonpartisan way. I don't endorse candidates or ballot measures. And, and I am focused 100% on the process, uh, making sure that voters can vote and that we're conducting uh, elections in a secure and efficient manner and upholding the fairness. Once you, as the chief election officer, lose focus of the process and are more focused on the outcome, that is a problem. We cannot have people running our elections that, that want a certain outcome. It just can't work that way. Right, because isn't the fear that anytime you lose an election, you'll just claim fraud in the future and then call for an audit. And so it sets the precedent uh, that you just, if you lose, then you don't accept the results, right? Right, absolutely. And even the fact that um, Secretary Raffensperger, as you just talked about, is supporting this new audit in Fulton County, which is, as far as I can tell, not any more of a real audit than what's happening now in Maricopa County, that continues to undermine what we've said all along about the election, that, that the election was fair, that there was no fraud, and the results we certified were accurate. It's so strange to watch Brad Raffensperger sort of tie himself in a pretzel knot uh, to try to land on the side of the Stop the Steal crowd when he was the person who certified the election before and there was no fraud. And, in, and he's taking, you know, the lead of the folks in Arizona, which, you know, don't take the lead of the cyber ninjas. That's not smart. <laughs> Arizona's Secretary of State. Katie Hobbs, thank you so much for being here tonight. Please stay safe. Before we go to break, it's not all doom and gloom out there. There are a few bills working their way through state legislatures that would expand voting rights. The first one is in Vermont, where a bill just passed that would give every registered voter in the state a mail-in ballot. What a concept. This is something that was done last year to make it easier to vote during the pandemic, and it was a big hit. It's a similar story in Massachusetts. State legislature there is working on a measure to extend their mail-in voting system created last year because of COVID concerns. It allows anyone in the state to apply for a mail-in ballot. The interesting wrinkle in these two states is that both states have Republican governors and both have expressed support for these ideas. What a refreshing sight. Republicans in favor of expanding voting rather than trying to make it more difficult. Maybe they can start a trend. <laughs> Coming up. Before this wave of voting restrictions and so-called audits, the big, the big lie helped, in, helped inspire a mob to storm the U.S. Capitol. Former RNC chair Michael Steele joins me to talk about the lack of Republican support for a bipartisan January 6th commission in the Senate. We're back in 60 sec seconds.
Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says the Senate will vote on creating a commission to investigate the events around the insurrection very soon. It passed the House last week with the support of only 35 Republicans. And right now, there isn't a single, not one, not a single Republican senator who supports the bill. I think it's too early to create a commission, and uh, I, I believe Republicans in the Senate will decide that it's too early to, to create that commission. You know, commissions often don't work at all, and when they do work, like the Simpson-Bowles Commission produced a good result, uh, nothing happened as, a, as part of that result. The one commission that we generally think did work was the 9-11 Commission, Chris. I think that was, I was part of putting that commission together. I think it was 14 months after 9-11. But the longer Congress waits, the longer it's going to take for people to learn the truth about what happened that day. According to a new poll, 54 percent of Republicans believe the insurrection was committed by left wing protesters trying to make Donald Trump look bad. In fact, check, it was not that. In the same poll, 53 percent of Republicans said they still think Donald Trump is the president, which fact check, he is not. He's literally in Mar-a-Lago. Retired. Joining me now is Michael Steele. He is the former chair of the RNC and an MSNBC political analyst. I've started calling Donald Trump the retiree in Mar Mar-a-Lago just to make myself smile sometimes. I, Thank you for I being actually, here, Michael. Uh, no, it's great to be with you. I mm -hmm. actually call it Elba. <laughs> as, as they dispatch <laughs> Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So, serious. Okay. Yes. If, if Republicans can't even come to the table to vote for a bipartisan commission to look into the question of who attacked them at work and how to prevent it from ever happening again, are they going to come to the table to negotiate for anything else? No, no. And, and I really think that everyone just needs to get their head around the, the truth that you just spoke. Uh, there is no inclination inside the Republican camp to either A, uh, pull back uh, the, the covers on, on what happened in January 6th to see all the fingerprints uh, that were on those Capitol doors and windows, um, who was involved, the levels of communications between the White House, the Congress, and the insurrectionists. They don't want to have that conversation. With respect to policy, uh, no. I mean, look, you've got uh, the the uh, infrastructure bill. You've got certainly uh, bills on dealing with uh, criminal justice, et cetera. None of that's moving. None of that's moving. Voting rights, forget about it. Because there are too many wins potentially for the Democrats, specifically Joe Biden, uh, to get credit for. Uh, when you look at the polling, the American people, and this is the funny part about it, I guess ironic, that Republicans like what Joe Biden is doing. You put a poll saying, you know, 53 percent of Republicans think that, uh, you know, Trump is still the president. Well, 54 percent think, no, that Biden is. And that 54 percent, they like what he's doing. Uh, so that yeah. that is the problem that Republicans find themselves in right now. And so they just hunker down, say nothing do nothing, uh, and hope that by the time we are at this point next year, a lot of Americans will have forgotten, and they can go back and say, oh, gee, look at all these socialists over here who want to spend a lot of money you don't right. have, uh, tax you again, et cetera. So it's a good point about the fact that we focus a lot on the 50% who believe the lies, but you're right to point out that there's that still means half of the Republican Party does not believe the lie. So I will, you know, I'll concede that because mm -hmm. that's a fact. Um, but why aren't Republicans proposing any policies, right? Even for that 50 percent who doesn't believe the lies, because it seems to me that they could just propose alternatives that are more conservative to the president's right. infrastructure plan. But it only seems like Mitt Romney is interested in participating in that exercise. Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and it really just boils down to, uh, to two things, power and money. And the power and the money is anchored around the stupidness of Marjorie Taylor Greene, the, you know, the sort of playboy crazy of Matt Gates, and, and so that's where, that's where the energy is. And you know, political systems uh, tend to get overwhelmed by the energy. 
you know, we see it at election times, you know, just in a normal course of election. People get fired up and go out. You turn out your base. You turn out your vote. What we're seeing now, instead of just putting that in your traditional political cycle, it is 24-7. And that is one of the features mm. of Trumpism that was brought to the nation's politics was that we're now on this 24-hour clock politically where it doesn't matter what else is going on. We're going to drive particular narratives. And if something, if we're somehow offended because we're just little snowflakes, right? And we don't like, we don't like mm -hmm. the way an election turned out and we don't like what people are saying about us, guess what I do? That's okay. I just put it on my phone, baby, and go raise $3 million. Um, and so that's where, that's where the energy is. Um, it's not in policy production. It is not in democracy. It damn sure isn't in democracy because they're trying to undo elections. Um, and is not in even in sort of rehabilitating the Republican Party. Um, it is really playing the power grift right now. And they're successful at it. You can't take that away from them. They're successful at it. But a question I have that I, I think about a lot, especially now, because, you know, I, I ask myself, like, why does Mitch McConnell get out of bed? Right. I mean, like, does he like his job? Does he plan? Does he have a to do list? Is there anything on it uh, when he wakes up in the morning? Like, why are they there if they don't want to do anything? Is it just like we're going to make some noise, raise some money and get reelected? But to what end? What do they actually so, want to do with this power? Um, power for the sake of power is, is an intoxicating thing when you know you can mess up someone's day just because you're in the room. I mean, just stop and think about the last 12 years, not the last four or the last, the last 12 years, going back to 2009, uh, right through right now. What's the big policy proposal that Republicans put on the table? Uh, right? It was infrastructure week for two years. <laughs> okay. There was no health care. <laughs> Every time they Every time it was infrastructure week, somebody got indicted. That's what happened. Right. <laughs> that was, that was, that's the infrastructure they were building, indictments. Um, there was no health care plan. There was a tax cut. But when you peel that back, that was not a middle class tax cut. That didn't benefit really the working poor, especially the working poor in this country, let alone the working middle class. Um, so what has been the big policy uh, narrative for the party? Um, we've told white women to be fearful of black folks in the suburbs. We've told black people that there are fine people on both sides. And, you know, you know, whatever happened to uh, that poor young man uh, in, you know, uh, who was killed uh, by a cop? Well, you know, he was a criminal anyway. So, you know, so what are, what's our narrative? It's all over the place. Um, and so this expectation is suddenly Mitch McConnell who doesn't have the power to churn out more judges for, for Republicans. Um, and the only power really has is to stand there and say, we're not going to do anything to help Joe Biden. That's how the day begins, and that's how the day ends. Yeah, I guess judges was something to get him out of bed before. But now I'm like, what is it? And then, you know, my, my thought is, you should want to help the American people via right. this legislation. It's, it's not giving Joe Biden a win. Uh, maybe it helps him politically to pass something, but it actually helps the American people, which I thought is the point of running for office. But sometimes I'm very naive when it comes to these things. Michael Steele, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please stay safe. Come back anytime you want. Anytime. Coming up. Critical race theory in schools. Why teaching students about the history of systemic racism in America is a problem for some people. Plus, no police at New York Pride. I'm getting into the pushback from the LGBTQ officers on banning the NYPD from the parade. We're back in 90 seconds.
week is the official start of LGBTQ Pride Month. It honors the Stonewall riots that happened in 1969. New York City police raided the gay bar, the Stonewall Inn, which then led to protests and clashes between patrons and the police. Now, every year, on the last weekend in June, New York City hosts the biggest pride parade in the entire world. Politicians, activists, and even companies like Comcast, NBC, Universal build floats and millions of people march throughout downtown Manhattan. For the first time, the organizers of the parade have announced that they have banned New York City police from working security at the parade. They also don't want them marching in it. Comes after last year's queer liberation march during the racial reckoning where protesters clashed with officers. The parade's organizers said in a statement, the sense of safety that law enforcement is meant to provide can instead be threatening and at times dangerous to those in our community who are most often targeted with excessive force without reason. But while the decision comes with anger that has been brewing for years, even decades, some say that LGBTQ officers should be allowed to join the festivities. And joining me now is one of those people making that argument, Jonathan Capehart. He's a member of the Washington Post editorial board and he's the host of the excellent show, the Sunday show on MSNBC on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., which I never miss, by the way, I have to say, Jonathan. Um, thank you so <laughs> much so for enough. joining us again. Great to be so, here. So, Jonathan, you write about the long history uh, between the NYPD and the LGBTQ community. So why do you think that LGBTQ officers themselves should be allowed to participate in the actual march itself? So when I went to my first LGBT pride, and then it was just called Gay Pride Parade in New York City, it was about 1991. And, and it's still probably true today, I haven't gone in a, in a long time, but there were two moments in the parade that always got huge applause. First, the start of the parade of the lesbian motorcyclists uh, dubbed Dykes on Bikes. They come roaring down Fifth Avenue, and that marks the start of the parade. And then another time when there was always big applause was when um, gay and lesbian police officers marched in the parade in their uniforms. And in 1991, you have to remember that the country banned lesbians and gay men from serving openly in the military. Like we're actively talking about that. And yet here were New York City police officers who were uh, lesbian and gay and bisexual, and uh, I don't know if there were transgender officers, but there they were marching proud in their uniforms. And so, um, you know, I think they should march proudly in their uniforms. Now, that, that being said, I do understand where Heritage of Pride, the New York Pride Parade organizers are coming from. I understand the anger, I understand the concern, I understand all the things that they're saying about the sight of police officers being triggering for um, uh, folks who are going to all the festivities. Where I'm drawing the line, and I understand keeping NYPD a block away from any, any of the parades or any of the festivities, I understand all of that. Where I draw the line is you're gonna tell LGBTQ police officers that they can't be proud of who they are and be proud of who they are in their profession and to actively march in the parade that is meant to celebrate who they are. Fine, be angry I with the NYPD, a, but yeah. don't take it out on yeah. the cops, on the LGBTQ cops. I'm gonna be very specific about that. Yeah, that's the piece that I, I didn't quite understand. And I mean, you spoke to an activist named Richie Jackson who said, we're also taking away something from LGBTQ kids, which is they won't be able to see cops marching to see that um, police as an occupation has a place for them. We're robbing them of that possibility. I feel like this is both a conversation about representation, but also, you know, members of the community, they're not able to participate in pride. Like they're a member of the LGBTQ community and they can't march with their own community. And so it feels to me like it's, it's both representation and also a connection 
to the community you belong to. Right, right. And Richie is making the point that, you know, his whole mantra is uh, in his um, in his book, Gay Like Me, Father Writes to His Son, he says, you know, our community doesn't have a litmus test. We don't have barriers. We don't say no to anyone. We are we are accepting of all. And if you've gone to any pride parade anywhere in the world, yeah. it is about inclusion and acceptance. And it's just the height of irony that this community is shutting the door on LGBTQ people because of what uh, of their job, not because of who they are, but because yeah. of what they do. Yeah. And you know, the pushback I've been getting, Zerlina, is well, it's not you know because of what they do is what they do to the community, which I think is a broad brush that is beyond problematic. Right. So what you're saying is those LGBT, LGBTQ cops, they're all bad cops. They're the abusive cops. They're the cops who pepper sprayed um, all those folks who were marching in the queer liberation um, uh, police anti-police brutality protest last June mm -hmm. in Lower Manhattan. That is a broad brush that is unfair. Yeah, it's it's never good to paint a broad brush. The one thing I will say, broadly speaking, about Pride is it is the most joyful place I've ever been. Um, you know, I am a straight uh, woman, but when I go to Pride, it is like, I don't, th there doesn't need to be police presence because everybody is happy. <laughs> everybody is joyful. <laughs> everybody is accepting and smiling and just like, it's a place where you can feel the love um, as soon as you walk up to uh, anywhere near Fifth Avenue that day. Jonathan Capehart, thank you so much for being here. I agree actually with you and your op-ed. <laughs> and you can watch Jonathan on The Thanks. Sunday Show with Jonathan Capehart at 10 a.m. Eastern on MSNBC every single Sunday. I never miss it. Thank you so much. Tomorrow will mark one year since George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. His killing sparked a national racial reckoning and many school districts began to offer anti-bias training to teachers and to expand their teaching about race and racism in the United States. But that anti-racism work has produced a very predictable backlash. At the university level, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones was denied a tenured teaching position at the University of North Carolina. Conservatives had criticized her appointment because of her involvement in the New York Times 1619 project on the legacy of slavery. And some state lawmakers around the country are pushing to ban or limit schools in teaching the 1619 project and critical race theory. Critical race theory is an academic field that has been around for decades. It mainly says that racism is not just the actions of a few people but that it is systemic and baked into laws and public policy. In Texas, lawmakers are advancing a bill that says teachers can teach critical race theory or the hist cannot teach critical race theory or the history of oppression, oppression of women, but they have to present the other side. We want to make sure that teaching hateful rhetoric like one race is better than the other um, it's to demean one sex over the other, to demean one gender, one um, racial background over, over another is, is hateful and we don't want that communicated in our Texas schools. Now, if you want to talk about critical race theory, if you want to was a Republican lawmaker in Texas who is sponsoring the bill. He seems to be saying that it's not racism that is hateful, it's the teaching about the racism, which is strange. And what would be a different perspective on racism that it's okay? It's a weird debate. And joining us to break this all down is Hassan Jeffries. He's an associate professor of history at Ohio State University and author of the book, Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm so happy to have you here for this really important conversation because it seems to me that states like Texas, you know, they're going out of their way to ban or limit teaching critical race theory. What is that about? What are they really so afraid of? Well, Zerlene, it's great to be with you. Um, you know, this is about politics, uh, unfortunately. 
uh, the idea of critical race theory or just talking about racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, talking about the centrality of slavery in American history, the 1619 Project, has become this, this call on the part of uh, the Republican Party, GOP, from Donald Trump, former president, to current sitting senators, uh, to state legislators, uh, to rally the uh, conservative base. It's, it's, it's culture war politics. Um, and and it, it's just a new version uh, of an old trope. Uh, but unfortunately, it, you know, it, it would be something if, if, if that was it and we could just dismiss it as that politics, you know, sort of racial politics the way we have seen in the past. But unfortunately, this is getting into the classroom uh, and it's impacting mm. uh, and, and, and what our kids, children of all colors, all races and ethnicities uh, can learn about the past. And that is terribly problematic. It seems really problematic for, you know, one simple reason. You know, the idea that there is systemic racism, I mean, you either have to believe that is true, or you look at the fact that basically we've had uh, only white presidents, except for one, um, mainly white senators, uh, in fact, there's zero senators uh, right now that are black, um, or there's no black women in the Senate, excuse me. I don't know if that's Cory Booker, who I love, state, home state of New Jersey. Um, there are very few uh, black people in positions of power when it comes to corporate America. You've never had a black woman be the governor in the United States. Seems to me like either that's systemic racism or you believe that white people are superior. That's actually why they are in charge of everything. Yeah, you know, and that's the problem, because in thinking about this as an educator, if you remove the importance of race and specifically racism and white supremacy to the American experiment, to the American project, then what you're left with is fantasies and fairy tales. Nothing makes sense. And that's part of the problem, the dilemma that you're putting educators in, because they're bound by a different kind of oath, kind of a, a Hippocratic oath for educators. And that is do no harm. You can't miseducate. And when you leave out the importance of race and racism and gender and sexism to American history, then I don't know what the heck you're teaching, but it's not the truth. Why do you think conservatives say, uh, or why do you think conservatives think that white students will feel like they're being blamed for systemic racism? It seems to me that Gen Z, they understand history. I mean, they grew, they're digital natives. They grew up being able to Google all of this history. It's not like we can straight up lie to them and they're not going to go check, fact check it, right? No, that's absolutely true. And, and what they're actually doing are using young people, using young white kids as sort of scapegoats for their own politics. Because if you are able to deny the existence of systemic racism, then you don't, then you don't have to come up with policies that actually address the issue then the problems mm. of racial disparities, the problems of inequality, then become the fault of people of color, then become the fault of women. You don't have to deal with it. But if you begin to talk about it, if you begin to look at, take a long view at this history, then you realize kids, young people, the next generation, the current generation will realize, well, heck, these problems aren't of their own making. These problems are societal issues mm -hmm. and we need to deal with them. And that's exactly what they don't want to do. So last question, let's turn to Nicole Hannah-Jones, who I mentioned in the intro, uh, being denied tenure at UNC. Do you think that will have a chilling effect on, you know, folks who study race and critical race theory and, and really black history, frankly? Um, do you think it will have a chilling effect on them because they will fear that going too far out on these issues will, you know, risk their uh, future ability to get tenure? Possibly, possibly. I think uh, because it's an example of somebody who was denied tenure solely because of the work that they were doing. And that goes against the core principles of academic freedom. But I'm actually a little less concerned about academia. I mean, that was a political board making a political decision all the way up until that point. Everyone in the institution was supportive of granting her tenure. So I'm a little less concerned about a ripple effect there but more concerned about the chilling effect that this will have on educators K through 12 who don't have mm. the advantage of academic freedom, who don't have tenure like I do right now, and I have this ability to talk about the truth in these particular ways. That's where I'm really worried, and that will have a ripple effect 
uh, for how what children learn and what teachers feel comfortable teaching down the road. That's a really good point because certainly this a lot of this stuff should be taught in high schools. And frankly, you know, what teacher wants to step out and risk their entire pension um, if there is uh, there will be potential retaliation? So we'll keep talking about this because it, it's, it feels important that we know what critical race theory actually is and what it is not. Uh, Hassan Jeffries, thank you so much for being here as always, and please stay safe. Over the weekend, Simone Biles proved yet again that she is the GOAT, the greatest of all time. It has been absolutely unbelievable to watch every single time. Here we go. Wow. Unbelievable. Biles completed the Yurchenko double pike, becoming the first woman ever to do so in competition. And full disclosure, I am a former competitive gymnast. I can't begin to tell you how hard that vault is to do. It's a complicated move, and she does an entire rotation more than most gymnasts. You'd think this skill would be highly rewarded by the sport, but nope. The judges assigned it a lower start value than coaches and competitors expected. Now, maybe that's because they were concerned for the safety of other gymnasts trying it, or maybe they were worried that Biles is so much more talented than other gymnasts that they needed to level the playing field, so to speak. Whatever the reason, it's just not fair. At the end of the day, Simone Biles is still a black woman, and you can count the number of black women who have won the Olympics in gymnastics on maybe both of your hands. By undervaluing her history-making athletic feats, it seems like the Gymnastics Federation does not want to let a 24-year-old, four foot eight inch black woman run away with the competition, even though she'd win without doing the most difficult moves. Simone Biles is so good that she could fall on every single event and still win the Olympic Games. That's how much better she is than everyone else. That's how much difficulty she packs into her routines. But while the Federation is trying to keep Biles down, it's a response that we have to remember. She said, I do it because I can. She said that it doesn't matter how this vault is undervalued by her sport. She's going to do it anyway. So therein lies the lesson for the rest of us. If someone tells you you can't do something, especially when you know you're capable, do it anyway. Simone proved to all of us that no matter what some people try to do to put us down, we can and should rise above it. And we'll fly higher than they ever could. Coming up, a high school yearbook surprise. Florida school edited the photos of 80 female students. And I'll tell you why when we're back in 60 seconds. Remember picture day in high school? I'd spend hours picking out what I would wear and perfecting my hair. That's especially true for senior year pictures. Here's mine. I sat in the chair all day long to get those braids. <laughs> but now, imagine picking up your yearbook and seeing that your picture has been edited without your consent. That is what happened to 80 female students at Bartram Trail High School in St. John's, Florida. The teacher who edited the yearbook apparently decided that their outfits violated the school's dress code. 
as you can see here, the girls' pictures were edited in really odd ways to cover more of their chests. Now take a look at this photo from that same yearbook. Yes, that's two boys from the swim team in their Speedos. Nothing about them is edited to cover up anything. The school's dress code states girls cannot wear shirts that are considered revealing or distracting. Also, midriff or cutout dresses and cutout tops may not be worn. But this isn't the first time the school has decided what is and isn't appropriate attire. Two months ago, 31 girls were pulled out of class because of what they were wearing. Parents are saying there is an obvious double standard. Look, high school can be tough, and it can be especially hard for girls because of peer pressure. Now you're essentially objectifying teenage girls and then saying it's their fault and punishing the girls for that objectification, which makes absolutely no sense. So joining me to discuss is Liz Plank. She is a journalist, author, and columnist for MSNBC Daily. Liz, one reaction I had is that when adults get so bothered by what girls are wearing, I'm like, why are you looking mm -hmm. at the girl and like thinking about cleavage? Like, doesn't that say more about the adults mm -hmm. than the girls? Absolutely. It says so much about our society that, you know, dress codes are not for the girl's sake, they're for the boy's sake, right? They're uh, not designed to protect girls from violence. They're designed to protect boys from accountability, from their own actions. Uh, and dress codes are bad for two reasons. And you've uh, given us such a great uh, explanation of why, but let me add, first of all, that they do not work, right? If dress codes worked, um, girls would not be sexually harassed, would not be sexually abused. Uh, almost every girl who's been a teenage girl has experienced all of those things. So dress codes, uh, I had some when I was growing up. I know you probably did so too. 20, 30 years later, uh, we still have all of these issues. And the second thing that's important to talk about when we talk about dress codes is that they're very unhealthy. As you mentioned, being a teenage girl is hard enough. Uh, the body shaming that you impose on yourself based on how society perceives you, based on all of the messages that young girls receive, mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, having it be sanctioned by your school or your principal, right, or the male professors that are in charge is extremely creepy. It just sets you up to think that it is your job to control men's behaviors. Well, that's exactly it because, you know, dress codes basically tell girls that you should be quote unquote modest, right? And mm -hmm. if you are modest and you're a good girl, then you'll avoid yeah. sexual assault. You're, you'll avoid sexual harassment. But that is a lie. You can't actually respectability your way out of assault mm -hmm. because it's the person committing the assault that is the problem. So when we're when we're telling girls to dress mod modestly, isn't that just basically making girls responsible for the boys behavior? Right, which is not in their control, right? Uh, and, you know, sexism produces really bad problems, but sexism also produces really bad solutions. And to me, this is a parody of a bad solution. I mean, look at that Photoshopping. Look at how awful that looked. In some of these photos, the girls look like they're they're literally like we're naked underneath and there's a black bar hiding their bodies. It, it's it's completely, uh, 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 I think, offensive um, to th there we go in that image. Um, and so the very bad solutions that we come up with are things like dress codes. That why that's why it has not worked. And that's why girls continue to be subject to all kinds of uh, difficulties, whether it's sexual harassment or sexual abuse when they are in school. And so we have to start thinking outside of the box of sexism and patriarchy, because the problems that dress codes are trying to address are real problems. It's just the solutions do not work and actually add more harm. Definitely. The other piece of this as well is that teenage girls struggle with their body image, and as many as one in mm -hmm. 10 suffer from some type of eating disorder or disordered eating. I mean, I did sports and I said I did gymnastics and track and field, and I also no. did track and field. I don't know that I met I love it. a teammate. I didn't have a teammate that didn't have some sort of issue with food. Mm -hmm. Does strict dress codes like this reinforce, you know, the shame that girls are acculturated to have about their changing bodies at this age? Yeah, it, it again, it, 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 uh, girls are already objectified, right? Girls already are, are subject to all of this attention and policing and surveillance. So to 
again, have it be done by their school, by, by, by an educational institution just adds more harm. And, you know, I, I want to share something too. It's insulting to girls. It's also insulting to boys. Uh, I did some reporting back uh, a few years ago in, in Kentucky. There was actually a school where uh, uh, these young girls actually were able to change their dress code. Um, there were all kinds of rules about collarbones being exposed and you know the a credit card being used to measure their tops, like very very uh, ridiculous things. And so one thing that they told me was that you know it's very insulting for us as as girls, but the boys are almost just as mad as we are. Because what do dress codes tell uh, boys? They tell them, well, you have no willpower. You have no control over your actions. Mm. And that objectifying girls and objectifying the opposite sex is something you can't help, right? And that we need to cover them cover them yeah. up so that you don't screw up. And, and that's very, I, you were talking about Gen Z, right? And, and how different right. they are as a generation. I think there are a lot of Gen Z boys who are insulted by that um, as well. So I'd love to hear them uh, scream and shout about this just as much as the girls. Who knew somebody in the world is like, we need to cover up collarbones. And then they created a mechanism to measure. It's just weird. People have it's, strange mm -hmm. things that they're focused on. They need more yeah. hobbies. Okay, Liz Plank, <laughs> thank you so much um, for being here. Thank it was you. incredibly important and serious conversation, but also I like to make jokes. Uh, that does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. The Mehdi Hassan Show is coming up after this short break. And tomorrow we will have a one hour special uh, to note the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. That's tomorrow night. Mehdi Hassan is coming up after the spring. Tonight, the big lie that the 2020 election was stolen is in full effect on the ground in Arizona, and Republicans have more states in their sights. Are they just planning on rigging the 2024 election in plain sight? And as the Biden administration makes its trillion-dollar infrastructure push, I'll talk to the former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, about the state of the economy and his Twitter beef with a certain far-right member of Congress. Plus, a bombshell book about the Obama White House says the former president called his successor, Donald Trump, a mother what? I'll speak to the author about that revelation and many more ahead.
Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. It's been 124 days since Donald Trump left the White House and boarded Air Force One bound for Mar-a-Lago and never came back. But according to a new poll, 53% of Republicans believe Trump is still the actual president of the United States. Mass delusion, I think it's fair to call that. And look, you may laugh at these Trump supporters who have bought into his big lie that the election was stolen. What can they do now other than accept the truth eventually and move on? Well, actually, no, there's a lot they can do, it turns out. Look at Arizona, where Senate Republicans have left a bunch of partisan volunteers and contractors perform a sham audit on more than two million ballots cast in Maricopa County during last year's election. They hunted for traces of bamboo on the ballot, seeking evidence for an outlandish and racist conspiracy theory that votes had been flown in from Asia. They flagged ballots with slight folds and even suspected Cheeto stains, calling them irregular, even though state law says they're valid votes. They've committed virtually every offense that Republicans accused elections officials of doing last November. They won't even say who's funding their quote-unquote audit. And they've accused one local Republican supervisor of, well, let the county's top election official explain. You all have been subjected to six months of harassment. Supervisor Hickman has even been accused of feeding ballots to hundreds of thousands of chickens at his farm and then purposefully incinerating them. Now, that is a ridiculous story, and it's easy to laugh off. But as with Donald Trump himself, the fact that something's ridiculous doesn't mean it isn't dangerous. And as the audit nears a close, the danger is rising. Slate reporter Jeremy Stahl traveled to Arizona to witness the audit, and he chronicled its insanity in a new dispatch with a headline that should chill you. What if the unorthodox Arizona audit declares Trump won. It's an outcome that he says is looking more and more likely. The quote-unquote audit is being patrolled, quite literally, by armed Trump supporters outside the arena, like Kelly Smith, who came from California with a 357 Magnum, to guard against Antifa, he says, adding that Joe Biden belongs in Guantanamo Bay. Some supporters carry a banner with a graphic that's now ubiquitous on right-wing websites, showing 2020 battleground states as dominoes, with the message, quote, May Arizona be the first domino to fall. Former White House advisor and ex-Breitbart chairman Steve Bannon has said on his podcast that Arizona's phony audit, quote, is going to lead to Georgia and it's going to lead to Michigan. And while these pro-Trump conspiracy theorists continue to relitigate last year's election, others are seeking control of future elections. Politico reports that in Arizona, in Georgia, in Michigan, in Nevada, Republicans who challenged the 2020 results are now running for Secretary of State. And if they win, they could then oversee those states' elections in 2022 and, of course, 2024. As Politico puts it, the campaign set up the possibility that politicians who have taken steps to undermine faith in the American democratic system could soon be the ones running it. Some of them are even challenging incumbent Republicans who they deem insufficiently Trumpy. In Georgia, Congressman Jody Heiss announced he'd challenged sitting Secretary of State Republican Brad Raffensperger. Yes, Brad Raffensperger, who famously rebuffed Trump's request to, quote, find thousands more votes for him in last year's results, and who spoke with me on this show about the death threats that he got for it. Heiss says falsely, falsely, that there were systematic voting irregularities and fraud. And he calls Raffensperger a backstabber for not doing more for Trump. That's it. That's his whole campaign pitch. He plans to do more for Trump. It's a full court press from the GOP. And look, we've covered the Republican Party's nationwide attempts to make voting harder for minorities through new restrictions. Georgia and Florida took the headlines, yes, but the GOP has also succeeded in pushing those voter suppression measures in Arkansas, in Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, in Kentucky, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming. And Texas may soon join them. But the Secretary of State races and the sowing of new doubts in last year's election take the GOP's war on democracy to a whole new level. And just think what'll happen if they take the House and Senate next year. If you think they'll face resistance in Congress from never Trump Republicans when 2024 rolls around, well, listen to this from yesterday. How much 
culpability do Republican elites have for fertilizing the soil for the big lie? That is, that's not at all how I think about it. You won't be surprised to hear. I think Why? that when you look at things like voter fraud, it certainly exists. I will never understand the resistance, for example, to voter ID. I think you ought to have to show ID to go vote. Liz Cheney is not your friend. She may be willing to speak out against Trump, but not against Republican voter suppression laws. We've said it here before and we'll say it again. The conventional wisdom has been to look at 2020 and see a failed Republican attempt to overturn an election. But what if history remembers it differently? What if 2020 turns out to have been a successful dress rehearsal for a complete overthrow of American democracy in 2024? I'm joined now by Tim Snyder, history professor at Yale University and author of On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century. I'm also joined by Carol Anderson, professor of African-American studies at Emory University and author of One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy. Experts both, pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to have you both of you back on the show tonight. Tim, Carol, I'm going to ask you both the exact same question. I asked Norm Ornstein and Ruth Ben-Ghiat on this show last week. If the Republicans are in control of the House and Senate come 2024 and a Democrat wins the presidential election narrowly, do you believe a Republican Party in Congress will certify that Democratic candidates win in Congress? Yes or no? Tim? I think if the Republican candidate is running on the big lie, if that's their issue in 24, the way that it seems to be in 22, then the answer to your question is that a Republican candidate who loses the election will indeed be appointed by Congress to be president of the United States. Wow. Carol? Given that we have Republicans now who refuse to back the January 6th commission, which was about the overthrow of an election, a duly you know, a fair election, um, given that we have um, the refusal of the Republicans to um, go, go in on uh, impeachment, and given that they're doing all of this work to undermine democracy with voter suppression and taking over control of the um, electoral certifications, yeah. I, see, I, see the tw um, I see this as a dress rehearsal for 2024 where they will not certify. Wow, so that's Norm, Ruth, Tim, Carol, four experts on this show, all have answered that question as, uh, in a very, very depressing way, but it's important we have this discussion. We have to talk about this stuff now. And Tim, we have to point out that this election denialism is what Republican voters want. It's what they're craving. A Reuters Ipsos poll last week found that more than half of Republicans still believe Donald Trump is the real president right now. And last week in a CBS News poll, half of Republicans said that given a choice between appealing to the public with new ideas and policies or changing the voter laws, they want the party to focus on changing the voter laws in order to win. So I wonder, Tim, is this the tail wagging the dog? Who is leading who here, the base or the party leadership? Well, I, I think the thing which it takes a moment for Americans to understand is that the big lie, the, the big lie that Trump won, it isn't just a deception. It isn't just the absence of truth. It's, it's a church. It's a set of beliefs. And, and what it does is it gives the leader yes. power, even if he's out of office, because he defines the story. And it provides a kind of filter that, that, that tells you who's a real American or who's a real member of the, Repub real member of the Republican Party or, or, or not. Right. And so the consequence of the big lie is that it becomes the only issue rather than the the other issues. And it means that the candidates who are going to be running for office are going to be tested on that and, and not on anything else. So it, it, I was warning about this you know, last year because the, the big lie has a way of yes, filling up everything else. It is. And of course, it's not just the big election lie. Uh, there's also the big insurrection lie, Carol. Uh, in terms of the disconnect from reality among one of our two parties' voters, uh, that new Ipsos poll I mentioned also found that 54% of Republicans believe, quote, the January 6th riot at the Capitol was led by violent left-wing protesters trying to make Trump look bad. These aren't just lies. They're damned lies. They're dangerous lies. Is this... <laughs> 
I mean, how do we get past this guy? I know I've asked you this before. I've asked others before. What, I just looked at that poll result and I was just silent for a moment when I saw it today. What do we do when millions of Americans believe absolutely deranged things like that? You know, and part of what we're looking at is the information system where they're getting their, their, their lies fed into them and it's being reinforced and reinforced. And then when you have um, so-called legitimate forces in, in power, echoing these lies, saying, you know, this is this this was nothing but tourists. Um, these were um, these were actually this was actually something called Antifa, <laughs> Antifa, um, that that kind of of crafting a narrative to create a space where they feel comfortable, where they feel whole, where they feel empowered, where they feel that their nation is not being taken from them. Um, that's what's going on here. When Professor Snyder called this a church, we are looking at a theology here about power, about race and racism. Yes. That's what's happening here. So the big question is, what do you do about it? How do our elected representatives who are still sane, how do they resist this stuff? Uh, Tim, this morning, Punchbowl News reported that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has begun the process to force a vote on the creation of a bipartisan January 6th commission. That's part of the Senate Democrats' long-term game, it seems, long game, to force Republicans to block popular legislation, often enough for Democrats to then nuke the filibuster and put bills to an up or down majority vote. I wonder, given your expertise, what you've looked at around the world, is the long game enough here? If democracy is at stake, shouldn't Democrats be fighting harder and with a greater sense of urgency? Yeah, I think what you said at the beginning is very important. I mean, we, this is depressing, but we can't afford to be depressed. These these tactics are as old as de democracy itself in the U.S. and elsewhere. You lie about minorities to exclude them, you exclude them to antagonize them, and then when you antagonize them, you try to bring the whole house down. That's what's happening now. And so Democrats have to be ready to fight locally. They have to be ready to fight at the state level. They have to be ready to bring federal legislation. And there has to be the long game of telling the truth of having a commission where people can look back if there's still a democratic United States of America in a generation or two and have a report which tells them what actually happened. All of those things have to be happening at the same time. Yes, they do, which uh, is a tough one. Uh, Carol, I want to play you a clip obtained by reporter Ari Berman of Mother Jones magazine. Uh, this is Jessica Anderson, the director of the Heritage Foundation's political arm, uh, telling donors, conservative donors, how her group helped to astroturf voting restrictions in Iowa, Georgia and elsewhere. Have a listen. We're working with these state legislators to make sure they have all of the information they need to draft the bills. In some cases, we actually draft them for them, or we have a sentinel on our behalf give them the model legislation so it has that grassroots, you know, from the bottom up uh, type of vibe. And we did it quickly and we did it quietly. Honestly, nobody noticed. Carol. I mentioned earlier in the show that Arizona, what's going on in Arizona with their fake audit is bizarre. And we focus on it because it's bizarre, it's weird, it's dangerous. But it's not just happening in Arizona. As Jessica Anderson says, nobody really notices what these Republicans are up to at a local level with their astroturfing and their passage of voter uh, security measures, what they call. How do we get people to pay more attention? Because, OK, in Georgia, in Texas, people get worked up when it becomes high profile. But this is happening across the country. It is. And one of the things is that you've got lots of grassroots organizations out there, like Black Voters Matter, um, telling, the, telling the tale, doing the work. You've got um, the media, you know, pounding, pounding on this. And you've got folks who are saying our democracy is at stake because that's really what's going on here. We have to feel the fierce urgency of now. Um, the, 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 the casting of this erosion of democracy under the guise of legitimacy. So to call what's happening in Arizona yes. an audit, um, to call what's happening here in Georgia um, an audit, um, is in fact to do damage to that language. It is to control language, to cover what is really going on, which is to undermine people's access 
to the ballot box to to undermine the 15th amendment that's exactly. what's happening well put. Uh, Carol Anderson, uh, thank you so much for your time tonight and for your insights. Appreciate it. Uh, Tim Snyder, do stay with us because as we watch democracy being undermined here at home, we're also seeing cracks form across the globe. In Europe, those cracks are perhaps most visible in Belarus, where President Alexander Lukashenko, a man described as Europe's last dictator, did something that should send a chill down all of our spines, using a false bomb threat as cover and a fighter jet escort as insurance, Lukashenko ordered a Lithuania-bound flight to divert and stop in Belarus. Dissident Roman Protasevich and his girlfriend, Sofia Sapega, were then removed from the plane and arrested. They were standing in front of us with guns. They were checking our suitcases, but at the same time, they were arresting the journalist. How scared he was? Super scared. I saw, I looked at him directly into his eyes and it was very sad. Ryanair's CEO speculated that members of Belarus's secret service, eerily still called the KGB, were on board that flight. The New York Times reports before the plane even landed, Protasevich said he feared he would face the death penalty. And since Protasevich's name is on a government list of quote-unquote terrorists, that fear could potentially become a reality. The 26-year-old journalist appeared on video today claiming to be in good health and detained in a Minsk prison. He also admitted to organizing mass protests in what his allies are calling a forced confession. Protasevich was a part of a social media channel heavily involved in anti-Lukashenko protests in Belarus last year. EU-based airlines have been ordered to stop flying over Belarus, but it's unclear how Lukashenko will be held accountable or if he will be held accountable at all. As Reuters notes, sanctions by the EU and the US seem to have done little to rein in his strongman tendencies. So. Tim Snyder is still with us, an expert not just on democracy, but that part of the world. Uh, Tim, tell us your view of President Lukashenko. Explain to our viewers who he is and what he's trying to prove with this kind of dictatorial theatre. Well, it's, we really have a nice segue between your, your first segment and this segment, because, of course, Mr. Lukashenko is an extreme example of what happens if you don't count votes and if you pretend to win and if you refuse to leave office when you lose. Um, the man is, has, has asserted dictatorial powers in Belarus for a quarter century, but the situation has come to a head since last August when he clearly lost an election and faked a result and then just used violence for half a year in order to stay in power. So that's where we are now. The, the heroes in this story are the people who protested and the journalists. What Roman Partasevich did along with his colleagues was to use the internet in creative ways to make sure that Belarusians themselves knew that they were protesting and to make sure that people around the world had a sense of just how many Belarusians cared about their votes and cared about their votes being counted. That's what makes him dangerous to a figure like Lukashenko. That's what makes him dangerous to the regime in neighboring Russia. And that's why Belarus, probably with Russian support, went to such extreme measures to abduct him. So they went to these extreme measures and they seem to set a new authoritarian precedent. You have Lukashenko grounding a plane, a civilian airliner, to nab an opposition journalist. And so far, he seems to have gotten away with it. Um, Tim, we've seen Western officials say critical things about Lukashenko, including US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. But what concrete action can the quote unquote international community take to hold this particular strongman accountable? Yeah, I mean, n number one, I, I, I don't like it when the head of NATO or the head of the European Union or the American Secretary of State, you know, go on social media to criticize these things, because it's like it's like they feel that they if they find the correct formulations and they've already done something. And, and that's just wrong. Um, number two, I, I think it's it's very important to ask the question of what Russia expects to happen next. I think Russia expects the West to sanction Belarus. And in a way, that's a win for Russia because it pushes Belarus closer to Russia. Number three, I think we're kind of deluding ourselves by imagining that Belarus did this alone. 
Russia and, and Belarus have coordinated control over airspace. They cooperate very closely in military matters and intelligence matters. It's unthinkable to me that Belarus would have done something like this without at least Russian approval. It's very strange that Russia didn't mind that one of its own citizens was arrested by Belarus. It's very strange that the Russian and Belarusian press reaction was perfectly coordinated. So I think in a way what we should be thinking about is the question of how much responsibility Russia bears and then do something serious like, for example, stop Nord Stream 2, do something which actually gets Russia's attention, cut out the middleman and actually go to the source. All fascinating points uh, about a depressing story, another depressing story, but an important story. And we appreciate your insights. Timothy Snyder, thank you for your time tonight. In recent weeks, there's been a disturbing rise in attacks on Jews here in the United States, in some cases linked to the conflict abroad between Israel and the Palestinians. But overall, it's part of an ongoing rise in anti-Semitic incidents and hate crimes in this country. The situation has gotten so bad that earlier today, President Biden wrote a tweet condemning the, quote, hateful behavior we've been seeing. And what is he referring to? Just a warning. Some of these images may be shocking to see. In one incident in Times Square last Thursday, a 29-year-old Jewish man was punched, kicked and pepper sprayed near pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli protests that began shortly after a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas was announced. NYPD have arrested one man in connection and so far are investigating it as a hate crime. Also, I'm surrounded by like a whole mob crowd of people. Uh, they proceeded to, you know, obviously assault me, beat me, kick me, punch me, hit me with crutches. Similarly, diners at an L.A. restaurant were harassed by individuals shouting in anti-Israel comments at them. In the video, people converge on the diners and a fight breaks out with a man swinging a metal pole at the attackers who then begin to beat him. The LAPD is investigating this, too, as being motivated by anti-Semitism. Violent incidents like these haven't only been in the streets. Online, there's been an escalation in hateful anti-Jewish messages. Like 97-year-old Auschwitz survivor. Auschwitz survivor Lily Ebert. People left comments on her TikTok page praising Hitler and disgustingly saying happy Holocaust. It's even reached places of worship too. Police are investigating an incident from last Wednesday in Brooklyn where a man set fire to a building housing a synagogue and a yeshiva. The suspect has been charged with arson. It's because of this recent spike that on Friday, five Jewish groups sent a letter to the White House asking President Biden to take new measures to combat anti-Semitism. And Biden may do something. Just last week, he signed into law the Hate Crimes Act, which will provide more resources at the state and local level to report hate crimes and raise awareness about them. It was linked to the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans throughout this pandemic. And sadly, there's enough hate to go around. As NBC and local outlets have reported, there have also been attacks on mosques in recent days. Graffiti on the Tayyiba Islamic Center in Brooklyn read death to Palestine. As awful as this current wave of attacks has been, it's important to remember it isn't new, sadly. And that's especially the case with anti-Semitism. Last May, the Anti-Defamation League reported that anti-Semitism in the US had hit a four-decade high. In fact, 2019 was the worst year for attacks since the ADL began keeping record. On the right, four years of Donald Trump in the White House was four years of emboldening anti-Semitism. Look no further than some of his most staunch supporters. We saw it at the January 6th insurrection, people wearing Camp Auschwitz shirts. We saw it in Charlottesville in 2017 when demonstrators chanted awful things like, Jews will not replace us. Trump called them very fine people. And we're still seeing it today in our own government through a new generation of GOP headliners like Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's not only backed several anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, but this weekend she compared the House's mask mandate to the mass extermination of six million Jews. You know, we can look back in a time in history where people were told to wear a gold star and they were definitely treated like second class citizens, so much so that they were put in trains and taken to gas chambers in Nazi Germany. And this is exactly the type of abuse that Nancy Pelosi is talking about. Acclaimed economist and former U.S. Labor Secretary Robert Reich responded on Twitter saying she should be expelled from Congress. At one point saying, all you do is promote hate. He's right. And he joins me after the break. I'll speak to Robert Reich about the state of the economy, Republican attacks on unemployment, and yes, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Don't go away.
most historic legislation is about rebuilding the backbone of this country and giving people in this nation, working people, middle class folks, uh, people who built the country a fighting chance. That's what the essence of it is. It's been more than two months since Joe Biden signed the $1.9 trillion coronavirus relief package, bringing what the president called, quote, desperately needed financial assistance to individuals, schools, childcare centers, businesses, as well as local and state governments hit hard by the pandemic. But ask Republicans, and the essence of the legislation signed by President Biden is that millions of Americans who could now be working who should now be working or not. They would rather sit at home and do nothing while collecting unemployment. It's become an accepted narrative that the American Rescue Plan has been too generous. But as usual, it isn't as simple as that. For one thing, that convenient storyline ignores half a century of shrinking wages. Just look at that steady drop. So maybe those people decided they didn't want to return to work for the same poultry wages. And that's not the only systemic problem the pandemic has exposed. Take the restaurant industry, where front of house employees aren't just expected to work for bottom of the barrel wages, mainly for tips, but they also face working conditions in an industry that's historically been toxic, rife with harassment and alcoholism and drug abuse. Sounds appealing, doesn't it? We're not disputing that people are having trouble finding workers for their businesses. More Americans are vaccinated, more of the nation is opening up and many businesses undoubtedly can't find the help they need. So what's the explanation, the real explanation? Because maybe some Americans have simply decided to follow through on the implied threat in that old capitalist adage, well, if you don't like it, you can just leave. Joining me now to discuss this and enlighten us all is Robert Reich. He's professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. He was also labor secretary under President Bill Clinton. More recently, he's somebody who's been in a big row with far-right Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. More on that in a moment. But he's the author of the book, The System, Who Rigged It? How We Fixed It? It's now out in paperback. Uh, Robert, so nice to have you back on the show. I want to begin by taking a look at the unemployment rate. Uh, not just this week's, but over time, it still looks like it's recovering. It's falling from its massive pandemic spike. Is there anything in your view to support the claim that unemployment insurance payments provided by the American Rescue Plan has led to a worker shortage? I don't see any evidence of that at all, maybe. And you're right, Republicans are saying it over and over and over again. They are the masters of the big lie. Whatever they want to say, they say it in a very disciplined and repetitive way. Uh, and that sort of seeps yes. into the public discussion. But there's absolutely nothing to this. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, for one thing, we have a lot of women, uh, particularly women, workers who have dropped out of the wage labor force because they cannot get child care. And that's particularly been true during this pandemic when kids have been out of school. Secondly, you've got a lot of people who are still reluctant to go back into places that may be unsafe. And we know that uh, empirically. There's a lot of evidence and thirdly, I think it's fair to say there's no shortage. There's no wage, wage labor shortage. I mean, there's a shortage of living wage jobs. And there certainly is evidence that some people are rethinking their work and saying, it's not worth it to me to go back in at $7.25 an hour or even at $10 an hour uh, because these are not living wages. And it's... And this idea that unemployment payments are too generous, it's kind of galling to hear multimillionaire members of Congress and members of the Senate and House saying, well, $300 a week is just too generous. I mean, what's your response yeah. to them well, when they say that? That's right. $300, you have to understand, uh, and many people don't get it, uh, that these $300 a week in extra unemployment benefits are not really extra unemployment benefits. Uh, fewer than 30% of American workers who are out of jobs, uh, 30, fewer than 30% actually uh, are eligible for state unemployment insurance, which means that this $300 a week is all they get. Now, you try to live on $300 a week. It cannot be done in most places around yeah. this country. In fact, I venture to say it can't be done literally anywhere. Yeah, we talked in, uh, in uh, the start of this show, the previous segment about 
the war on democracy, and part of that is to do with the fact that we have this system where states can just decide what voting laws they're going to implement. The same applies in the economic realm, where states can just decide how to distribute unemployment benefits, and there is no uh, federal floor, which, as you point out, is a real problem. Two of your recent tweets, Robert, caught my attention. One is that the rich are currently playing, uh, are paying one-sixth, one-sixth of what they were in taxes in 1953. And the other is that if the minimum wage had kept up with CEO pay, the minimum wage would currently be $33 an hour. $33 an hour. Why is $15 so out of reach politically in this country when it should be a no-brainer, when you can't even get all of the Senate Democratic caucus behind $15 an hour? It should be a no-brainer, exactly, because you've got more and more wealth accumulating at the top. You've got Wall Street bonuses, executive pay, CEO pay, all of it rip-roaring ahead, even during the pandemic. You had, uh, during the pandemic, America's billionaires, I mean, just the billionaires, increased their wealth by 45%. So the idea that we cannot provide a minimum wage that has not been lifted in over 12 years, maybe, is absurd. I mean, the Democrats ought to be getting on this right away. Robert, what do you say to small business owners who say that raising wages will force them out of business or force them to fire people? Mom and pop types, should they get some sort of federal assistance to help pull this off to get through a transition? Well, we've been through this and the, there, we've been through these same arguments over and over again. What happens is, and we know this historically, and these small businesses ought to, be get, ought to get the evidence, when there is more money in the pockets of low-wage workers, they turn around and they buy things. They buy things in the local economy. They buy more meals. They buy more small things that small businesses have to offer. Small businesses do better because people are paid more. And they do even better when low-wage people are paid more because low-wage people spend everything that they received. Uh, and so, and this has been the history, we, we know this. I mean, since uh, the minimum wage was in instituted in 1938, uh, that has been the story. Uh, uh, small businesses complain, but once we get an increase in the minimum wage, small businesses find that their businesses improve. Interesting. I, it's, it's an important point that we have had these debates before. As you mentioned earlier, Republicans are very disciplined at pushing the same old talking points again and again. Robert, there have been reports that some workers have simply rethought their lives and their careers during this pandemic, during the lockdowns, uh, who describe the pandemic as an awakening and don't want to return to the way things were pre-pandemic. Um, and this isn't just true in the restaurant industry. There is a desire for a, a new kind of normal across our economy. And I wonder, isn't this the kind of reordering of the economy that happens after every major crisis, every previous low point, there's some things just don't go back to the way they were. Yeah, there is. I think that's exactly right, Mehdi. We don't go exactly back to where we were before. After major recessions, wars, uh, some sort of tumult, we know that people do have an opportunity to rethink a little bit where they are, what they're doing, what they're enjoying, what life is all about. It's not just about making money, obviously. People need enough money to get by. But many people say to themselves, look, I don't need to live exactly the way I am living right now. Maybe I can do it a little bit more simpler. Maybe I can enjoy my life a little bit more. Uh, you know, a pandemic of the sort that we just had does cause a lot of people to reconsider the most basic aspects of living. And I can see that going on all around. Yes, uh, very much so. Um, I have to ask before I let you go, you got into a Twitter row with far-right GOP Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, who apparently had never heard of you and said you didn't spell her name right. She couldn't spell Berkeley, where you teach correctly. Uh, were you expecting that weird personal response from her? Uh, no, I wasn't. Uh, but this is not anything personal. I mean, I, I think that, and I'm concerned about, uh, I'm just concerned about what happens in the workplace. I mean, I used to be labor secretary. And obviously, when one worker harasses or intimidates or threatens another worker, that worker who is booing their harassment and intimidation has to go. 
And if we're talking about Congress and what Marjorie Taylor Greene has done with AOC and with Cori Bush and many other members of Congress in terms of harassing, intimidating, threatening, well, that person should not be in Congress. I mean, these are the leaders of the country. They're supposed to be setting an example for us. And on top of that, you've got her hatefulness. Uh, and as it was displayed just uh, just Friday in talking about, uh, you know, the uh, analogizing uh, what uh, Nancy Pelosi is asking of members of Congress in terms of getting some proof that they have a, sh a flu shot uh, with what Hitler did to the Jews. I mean, this this kind of uh, nonstop hatefulness, it seems to me, requires a response. And it's not just her district, although the constituents in her district, I hope they throw her out. Uh, but also there should be some minimum standards of decency and truth telling in Congress, and if there isn't, uh, then then we yes. ought to establish. I'm so glad you mentioned the workplace issue and you being a former Labour secretary, because I just look at the situation, and it's not just Marjorie Taylor Greene. There are many others, as you know, in Congress who are breaking the rules, trying to go through metal detectors with, you know, pushing cops around, making all sorts of violent comments. And the problem is, there really is no, there's no HR department like in most workplaces. What do you do about these people who many Democrats, especially women of color on the Democratic side, feel threatened by? You talk about expelling them. You can't expel them. It's a two-thirds vote. The Democrats simply don't have the numbers to vote Marjorie Taylor Greene out of Congress. Strip her of a committee assignment. She doesn't care. She's not interested in committee work or legislating. It really leaves you with a conundrum. What is to be done? Is there any measure? Is there any halfway house between letting them do whatever they want and expelling them, which you don't have the votes for? Well, I think that public opprobrium really does count here. The public really does have to be heard. Uh, when you have characters like this uh, or others who are threatening the safety of people inside the House of Representatives, uh, four and a half months after we had an invasion of the Capitol, I mean, it would be bad enough this, if this were going at any other time. But remember, four and a half months ago, a mob stormed the Capitol, threatened the lives of, of literally every member of Congress. If we didn't have that as a clear memory and didn't suffer from a kind of collective amnesia, uh, then it would seem to me that this would be a no-brainer. We, we don't have and should not tolerate in Congress, and the public has got to speak up about this, we should not tolerate any threats, any intimidation, any kind of threats of violence at all. Robert Reich, uh, I hear what you're saying. I 100% agree with you. I'm not sure the Democrats do have a plan, though, to deal with these kind of figures. Uh, it feels like we haven't really been able to learn the lessons of the Trump era. What do we do about these people who say and do outrageous things? How do we condemn them without amplifying them? And how do we treat them as more than just ridiculous clown-like figures when, as you point out, they can be very dangerous? There was an insurrection just months ago, and the Republicans want us to forget that, which we won't on this show. Uh, Robert Reich, appreciate your insights on the economy and your comments about Congress. Always welcome on the show. Thanks so much. And Robert's book is out in paperback, of course, just a reminder there. When we come back... I'll talk about why the latest questions over where and how the coronavirus spread don't change how the Trump administration more than fumbled the response. Back in 60 seconds here on Peacock. Do not go away. Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, many on the right became obsessed with the theory that the coronavirus itself escaped from a lab in Wuhan, China, 
and then spread around the world. Remember how Republican Senator Tom Cotton was demanding early last year that China release evidence to prove it didn't come out of a lab in Wuhan. Even former CDC director Robert Redfield told CNN just this past March that he thinks the virus started out in a lab, acknowledging that others don't agree. For the most part, the theory has been constantly dismissed up until now as a conspiracy. But there's new information that's putting the lab escape theory back in the spotlight. The Wall Street Journal was first to report on a previously undisclosed US intelligence finding that three researchers from Wuhan's Institute of Virology sought hospital care after becoming sick in November 2019. The number of researchers and the precise time they fell ill are new details that go beyond a US State Department fact sheet from last year that only confirm that several researchers got sick in autumn of 2019. They had symptoms that were consistent with both COVID-19 and common seasonal illnesses. The evidence is far from conclusive of a lab escape. We don't know enough about this US Intel report either. But more and more scientists are calling for an investigation into that possibility, including President Biden's chief medical advisor. Are you still confident that it developed naturally? No, I'm not convinced uh, about that. I think that we should continue to investigate what went on in China until we find out to the best of our ability exactly what happened. Dr. Fauci is right. We need to know what happened, and China hasn't been transparent. In fact, American officials say unless China gives more access to their records, we might never know how COVID-19 came about. And that is simply unacceptable. We need a full, independent investigation by the WHO, by the international community. We need to find out how this started so we can prevent it from happening again. But, and it's a big but, if the virus escaped from a lab, and if we had known that in the spring of 2020, would things have been any different here in the US? Would that have changed our response, made things better for Americans? Would the Trump administration have taken the virus seriously instead of suggesting it would just disappear with the warm weather? Would they have backed lockdowns instead of opposing them and lifting them too early? Would they have come up with tests that didn't work? Would Trump have led by example by wearing a mask? Would he still have asked about whether or not you could inject your body with disinfectant? Would he still have admitted to Bob Woodward that he knew how dangerous the virus was early on but wanted to, quote, play it down? Would any of the almost 600,000 Americans who died from COVID-19 still be alive today? In my opinion, knowing whether the virus came out of a lab or not, that wouldn't have changed any of that. We know the answer to all of those questions. The truth is that hundreds of thousands of Americans are dead today, not because China lied, but because our government last year, the Trump administration, was almost uniquely among world governments incompetent, negligent, and dishonest. So, the, so those who've been espousing the lab escape theory can gloat all they want about this new attention on the possibility. I'm glad to see that Democrats and all these public health bureaucrats and scientific ex so-called experts like Dr. Fauci are coming around to accept what basic common sense would tell most Americans. They can gloat all they want, but let's be clear. They want to talk China and Wuhan and labs because they don't want you to focus on the horrific reality of COVID-19 here in the United States, the mass death, the mass suffering, and the fact that it didn't have to be this way. Up next, the new book that reveals Obama's true feelings about Biden's chances in 2020 and what Barack Obama really thinks about Donald Trump. It is fascinating stuff. And the author of that book joins us on the other side of this very short break. See you there.
There's much to be said about how Joe Biden triumphantly won the White House in his third attempt at running for president. And at 78 years old, he became the oldest president of the United States ever. And from day one, he inherited a range of historic challenges, a deadly pandemic, an economy in the ditch, the threat of climate change, and a so-called crisis at the border. So it comes as no surprise that during his campaign, he encountered the doubters, the naysayers, and the skeptics. I mean, we all witnessed, while on the road, then candidate Biden's gaffes, his mix-ups, his mistakes. Even his former boss, it turns out, was a skeptic. So much for that job reference. In his new book, Battle for the Soul, Inside the Democrats' Campaign to Defeat Trump, journalist Edward Isaac Devere tells how Obama was doubtful of Biden's candidacy and of his ability to energize a crowd. Devere says in Obama's eyes, Biden could strut, wear Ray-Bans, and then stumble. He did not mesmerize. Then there was the dramatic exchange during the first primary debate. Biden and his now Vice President Kamala Harris clashed on busing and racial segregation in one of the single most iconic moments of the primary campaign. In his book, Dovere recounted how Biden turned to Pete Buttigieg during a commercial break during that debate and said, that was some effing BS. Later in Battle for the Soul, Devere recalls Jill Biden had an even more colorful response on a phone call with supporters saying with what he cares about, with what he fights for, you get up there and call him a racist without basis? Go F yourself, she says in reference to the now vice president. Battle for the Soul gives an insider's look, a fly on the wall account of not only what Biden was up against during the post-Obama era, but also the backroom battles within the Democratic Party which continue to this day. So here to discuss is the author himself, Atlantic staff writer, Edward Isaac Dovere. Edward, thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations thanks on the me. book, grabbing rightly lots of headlines. Um, one of the remarkable revelations in your book is that Barack Obama, the man Joe Biden called his best bud, who he invoked in almost all of his ads and speeches. Obama had his doubts about Biden's campaign, his candidacy. I wonder, how did Joe Biden react to that privately? And what do we think their relationship is like right now? Well, they have a very close emotional, personal relationship. But what you see with Obama uh, is going back to 2018, 2019, as Biden was first getting into the race, when a lot of people were seeing problems with him. And through 2019, Barack Obama, much like many, many Democrats, was very skeptical of Biden. He was uh, extra skeptical because of what he knew about the job. He was saying before Biden got in, look, the presidency really weighs on people. It's hard for an older person. Everybody knew who he was talking about when he would say that. He talked about how Americans like their presidents to have some swagger. And he wasn't sure whether Biden had it. And even through 2020, you see Obama in this mode of saying, oh, is this going to work? Trump really needs to lose. I really want him to lose. Uh, can we make sure that Biden is able to do it? And, uh, of course, in the end, Biden did. Uh, Obama is not even at, at the end like, oh, this all makes sense. His response is, uh, I guess that worked. It, it came together. Yeah. And, I mean, I always wonder if Biden hadn't run. And we know people forget it was Obama who discouraged Biden from running in 2016, right, saying it's Hillary Clinton's turn. I owe her when Biden had thought about well, it's, it stepping in. That, and, and I always wonder if Biden hadn't. Yeah. Yeah, go on. No, 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 no please the, go on. The, the, the doubts that he had about Biden in 2015, Biden was in much worse shape as a candidate, but also personally with the death of his son, Bo. Remember, it's just it, it's Memorial Day weekend is when Bo Biden died. And uh, that yes. was Memorial Day 2015 to get a campaign ready by the fall of 2015 to run into 2016 against Hillary Clinton. Obama was really skeptical he could do that. And then the skepticism continued into... Uh, into getting ready for the 2020 recruit. I always wonder if Joe Biden hadn't run, would Obama have been a Kamala Harris guy or a Pete Buttigieg guy? I guess we'll never know. But it's always awkward no. for a VP to succeed a popular boss in the White House. I'm thinking Bush Sr. and Ronald Reagan. 
but especially if that former boss is still sticking around intervening in politics. Uh, when Obama publicly called for the Senate to end the filibuster at John Lewis's funeral and called it a Jim Crow relic, you say in your book that one of the main reasons he did that was to pressure Joe Biden publicly to get him on board, to try and get him to come out against the filibuster, which is a remarkable thing for a former president to do, but that hasn't worked so far. Biden hasn't come out against a filibuster, not fully anyways. So far, you're right. And part of what was going on there is that Obama was writing his own memoir, going through his own presidency and thinking about what he got wrong and thinking you got to be firmer with this. He did not want Joe Biden to be the conciliatory, working with Republicans all the time, always trying to strike a deal kind of president. He was trying to push Biden privately and in that case, additionally, publicly to be firmer. I do think that though, even though you haven't seen Joe Biden come out against the filibuster, you do see him taking a harder line than many Republicans and even most Democrats were expecting him to take as president. You know, the American Rescue Plan went through without a single Republican vote and Biden went straight ahead and on to the next thing. Indeed. And you write not just about the relationship between Vice President Biden and President Obama, but between now President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that now infamous primary debate where you say both Joe and Jill dropped F-bombs about Harris. And yet she seems to have had the last laugh, Edward. They put her on the ticket and she seems to be yeah. front of line to be the next Democratic presidential nominee if it's not Biden. How does she fix things with them? Well, some of this was a political calculation, right, on Biden's part. He wanted to win. He was stressing about how much damage was done to the relationship as he picked a running mate uh, and talking about it with, among other people, Barack Obama, who reminded him that though they had a great relationship uh, at that point, it hadn't started out that way. And Obama was saying, look, you got to win. The most important thing here is to win. If she, you think that she's the best one to win, then that's who you've got to pick. Biden picked her. They've had a much better working relationship in the first couple months as president and vice president than they had even during the campaign. They've gotten to know each other in a way that they hadn't. But it was hard. That left a mark, that debate. It, it stayed with not only Biden uh, and Jill Biden, but a lot of people around them, uh, a lot of aides. I report in the book that uh, a, a year after the primary debate, of course, that happened at the beginning of 2019, uh, or in June of 2019, rather, the beginning of the primary race. In June of 2020, on the anniversary of the day, there were people on the Biden campaign saying, oh, it's Kamala Harris Day, kind of laughing at it, making fun of it. Amazing, amazing stories in your book. And one of the most amazing of all, your book reveals Obama's thoughts on Donald Trump, his real thoughts. You say Obama referred to Trump as a corrupt, expletive, a madman, lunatic, a racist, sexist pig, among other things, uh, for a president who's known for his soaring rhetoric, his literary <laughs> eloquence. Uh, he refers to Trump as a lot of Americans might refer to Donald Trump. What were your thoughts, your reactions when you heard that? Well, Amedi, I, I wasn't under the impression that Obama was a Donald Trump voter before I was doing the reporting here. He <laughs> had a very low opinion of Donald Trump, but he made that clear. I think that what is catching people about these comments is how visceral it was for Obama, how much, you know, you get the sense of Obama as the, the cool guy sort of observing uh, from a distance. People have compared, compared him to uh, Dr. Manhattan in The Watchmen. But he was living it and breathing it the same way that a lot of uh, us were, and certainly that a lot of Democrats were, and looking at this and getting enraged by it. He, he, sees, Ob he sees Trump uh, meeting with uh, the Russian ambassador in the Oval Office, not having translators on the call, and he says, you know, that corrupt MFR, he does not use the word MFR, he uses the word. Uh, he, he racist, sexist pig, right? These are things that he uh, was feeling and that were coming out of him in private, but that he was being very careful not to say in public at the time. Yeah, it, it, I mean, yeah, it would definitely have grabbed our attention if that slipped out <laughs> on the stump. Um, I'm glad some breaking news now. tonight, Edward. Um, <laughs> Oh, yes, it has. It has. I say congrats on the book. Some breaking news, though. Mitt Romney of Utah becomes the first Republican in the Senate to say he will support uh, a House pass bill to create a January 6th commission. Well, sort of. Romney says he would support the cloture vote, which basically means he won't block a debate on the bill. Um, so, I mean, Mitt Romney, uh, is, he, is he the saving grace of the Republican Party? Yes or no? Does it make a difference if one Senate Republican comes out on this? What are you, what's your analysis of the situation right now? Well, look, at the inauguration on January 20th, I walked across the street after the ceremony 
And standing in front of the Senate Russell building was Romney on the corner there. And I said to him, what do you think about this now that you see Biden is inaugurated in this? And he said to me, you know, I think it's Winston Churchill said uh, America will do the right thing after it does all the wrong things. That's all in the book. And you can read about it uh, there. That conversation that I had with him, I happened to catch him at that moment. We know that Romney on the day of the riot turned to some of his Republican colleagues and said, you did this. You made this happen. The, there is a fury that Romney has, not just about what has gone on in the Republican Party under Donald Trump, but how the riot happened, the response to the riot. I don't think it's a surprise to see him wanting to make this commission go forward or at least not get in its way. The question is, and what he's raised over the last couple of days, is how do you ensure that it is bipartisan to the standards that he wants it to be bipartisan, but yet not bipartisan in a way that makes it so that it actually doesn't mean it doesn't come to anything the way that Kevin McCarthy apparently was talking about bipartisan, that it would investigate everything that ever happened with any political rhetoric that anybody was ever mad about. Yeah. Yeah. And we all remember, look, we all remember that video of Mitt Romney turning around and running in the other direction as the crowd is entering uh, the building. Uh, Edward Isaac Devere, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Once again, be sure to pick up his book, Battle for the Soul, Inside the Democrats Campaign to Defeat Trump. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and Facebook. And I'll see you back here tomorrow night, of course, live 7 p.m. Eastern right here on Peacock. Good night. Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. There are so many different levels to the Republicans' assault on democracy right now that sometimes I know it's hard to keep track, but here goes. It all started with a year-long misinformation campaign led by Donald Trump to sow doubt in the election process. Then Trump lost and 